Uh, this morning, something kind of was on my heart that I wanted to share with you and kind of on my return back. And, and um, I pray that it'll be a blessing to you. It certainly was um, to me. You know, these last couple of weeks, I, I, I was thinking back to those, those final moments that Jesus um, had with his disciples before uh, he, dis- he ascended up into heaven, right? There's like a 50-day a period from, from um, that time where he entered the streets of Jerusalem on Palm Sunday to when he was um, crucified, risen, and then here for 40 days and, and ascended into heaven, But that period kind of started with Jesus entering into the streets of Jerusalem. Do you remember that? Historians tell us that over two million people were present in the streets of Jerusalem as Jesus entered the city riding on a donkey. And they were waving palm branches and crying out, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And it was an appeal from the people for Jesus to set up a a political kingdom right there and right then. They were doing things like throwing their their cloaks on the ground, a a sign that they would be willing to lay down their lives if Jesus would just go and take the throne of the day and establish himself as a king. The gospel writers remind remind us that as Jesus saw this, he began to weep because the people did not understand and know the hour of their visitation. They didn't realize that he did not come to set up an earthly kingdom, but a, a heavenly kingdom. And this very same crowd that sang his praises on Sunday morning were the same ones who pointed their finger at him and cried out, crucify him. He went from the top prospect to public enemy number one in just a matter of days. And the disciples had seen all of this. They had walked with Jesus. And, and you could, if you could allow yourself to just imagine for a moment what that must have been like, just that, that emotional roller coaster that they were on. One minute they're singing his praises. The next minute they're crying out, crucify him. They were there when he was arrested. His disciples watched as as Jesus was beaten. They were there when he was crucified and when he was placed in the tomb. Imagine the emotional downshift that they had to embrace because just a week earlier, they were singing his praises. Their Messiah whom they waited for, this one that they walked with, and were so close with, now lay lifeless in a tomb. But we know he didn't stay there, right? That's why we're here today, right? We're here because of the resurrected Savior, Jesus Christ. I think sometimes the reality of the resurrection causes us to kind of miss the significance of all the events that led up to that because we kind of know the end of the story, and it's so, it's kind of easy for us to just kind of say, well, you know, eventually comes back, but if we would just remember and consider what that moment must have been like. Three days later, as the scripture said he would, and as Jesus declared he would, he rose from the dead. He conquers death and hell and the grave, and he rises from the dead. And he continues to walk with his people for 40 days, teaching and ministering, and how encouraged they must have been that Their Savior, who is at one time in a tomb, is back again. His presence is with them. They're probably thinking, this is it. Surely he's not going to go anywhere again. But after the completion of the 40 days, we know that Jesus would eventually ascend back into heaven. It's what opened the, the pathway for the Holy Spirit to come as promised where the Holy Spirit would come not just with the disciples as Jesus would would declare, but now the Holy Spirit would come within the disciples, God within his people. But prior to Jesus' departure, he would say some of the most encouraging of words, and it's that thought that I want us to focus upon this morning. We don't know exactly where on the timeline between the the resurrection and the ascension 
that these words that Jesus is about to say kind of lie, where, where they find themselves. It really doesn't matter when they were said so much as that they were said. And what I want to kind of bring us back to is when Jesus said in Matthew chapter 28 and verse 18, he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Now everything in this text is super significant to unpack, but, but I want to this morning, I want us to kind of zoom in on something that, that really reveals the, the heart of God, the, the plan of God, the, the purpose of God, and God's purpose and plan for redemption. And it's found in those words, those final words, where it says, where Jesus said, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Behold, I love that. It means get a hold of this. This group of disciples who have been through a, a roller coaster ride of emotion, I'm sure, found tremendous encouragement from those words. Behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. These are more than just words of encouragement and promise. I submit to you that they are words of prophetic fulfillment. I am with you always. God with his people. You see, that was the plan all along. It has always been the plan of God to be among his people, to restore that which was lost in the garden. God, when God created man, he created us with the intent of us being in relationship and fellowship with our creator. And we know that Adam and Eve walked with God until that dreaded day where they disobeyed God. They ate of the tree and they were and sin entered the world and they were removed from the garden and separated from God. But thankfully, that story didn't end. As early on as Genesis chapter three, we've got a picture of God letting us know that there's a plan that's in place for God to restore that which was lost in the garden. And the biggest thing that was lost in the garden was God being with his people. It's the plan all along. All of the prophets point to this reality. All of the Old Testament is, can be viewed as a, a finger that points to the Messiah, the one that's going to come, who's going to redeem his people and restore that which was lost from the curse. Isaiah prophesied 750 years prior to Christ's birth. He writes, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. That's not just a passage we read at Christmas time. That needs to be a reality every day of our lives. We shall call his name Emmanuel. It means God with us. This one that Isaiah prophesied about was going to come because God's desire and heart was to be with his people. This morning, I want to take you uh, take a brief moment and consider this, this idea of the God who is always there for you. And let me, let me just kind of let you know from the beginning, my, my, my heart's desires isn't so much to inform you. My guess is I'm probably not going to bring anything new to the table, but I want to encourage you and remind you and inspire you to, remind, to remember that God, the one who loves you, is always with you. And I want to bring about four truths that I see clearly laid out in the scripture. But, but something that, that, I'll be honest with you, a couple of weeks ago I was laying down, I woke up in the middle of the night, and then there were four truths that, that, that hit my soul so loudly, it woke me up out of a deep sleep. I didn't hear an audible voice from God, but these words kind of came to my spirit and just brought such refreshment to my soul. And it was this, I have been with you in the past, I am with you today, I will be with you tomorrow, and I will be with you forever. That's what I woke up to. And I was like, 
what, 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 what encouragement to my soul, and I thought I want to share this with my family. It's not the, the deepest of truths, but I don't know about you, but I find that some of the simple things are the deepest of truths. And I think sometimes when we get so familiar with the simple things, we become familiar with them because we don't allow them to go deep enough. And so this morning, I just want to take a, a moment. That wasn't new information. We see this idea un, 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 un revealed for us all throughout the scripture. And I want to take a moment and look at that. This idea of God saying, I have been with you in the past. I am with you in the present. I will be with you tomorrow, and I will be with you forever. I have been with you in the past. I love this because it reminds me that before I was ever aware of it, God's presence was in my life. Mariah, you'd think, I, you'd, you'd, think you'd heard this message already. I so much appreciated Mariah sharing and saying, I didn't even know God had his hand on me. I didn't realize I was looking, but he got a hold of me before I even realized it. How many times can you look back in your, at your journey and realize that you had no idea that the fingerprints of God were all over your life and you had no idea? God was there. Jeremiah was reminded of this by God as he is given this call by God to be a prophet to the nation. Look at Jeremiah chapter one and verse four. It says, now the word of the Lord came to me, Jeremiah saying, look, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Let's just stop there for a moment. Before I formed you, who formed you? God formed you. Before I formed you in the womb, God says, I knew you. You know, God cannot lie, right? He doesn't sensationalize. He doesn't exaggerate. This is reality. And what God is saying to Jeremiah is, before you even formed in your mother's womb, I knew you. And he says, before you were born, I consecrated you. And I appointed you a prophet to the nations. I have been with you, Jeremiah, long before you ever knew it. Before I even formed you, I knew you. Can I just tell you this morning that God knew you and God knows you. God knows you and me so well that he allows us to go through seasons of our lives that we begin to discover what's on the inside of our own selves because we don't even know ourselves as well as God knows us, right? Before I even formed you, Jeremiah, in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Listen to the psalmist, Psalm 139, in verse one. He says, oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from afar. I love that. In other words, you see it before I even, even am aware that they're entering my mind. You discern my thoughts from afar. Look at verse 13. He says, look, for you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. What a beautiful picture of, of intimacy, the way in which God intentionally, strategically, like a designer, knits us together. How many are so glad that we didn't kind of slither out of a pond as a single cell amoeba that eventually evolved into all these different things over time, and here we are. No. We were formed and fashioned and, and knit together by God in the womb. That's why every life is so precious, born and unborn. He says, I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. It speaks of a sense of reverence and awe. Wonderful are your works, he says. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret. I love that the Hebrew word there, secret, the Hebrew word there is sether. It literally means intimacy. When I was made in intimacy, when I was made in love by God, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Where are the depths of the earth? 
It's speaking of the womb, the, the unseen place where God intricately weaves his people together. What a beautiful picture of a great designer forming and fashioning his people. He says, you saw my unformed substance. Interesting. Could you imagine for a moment? See, we read these things and we say, that's really nice, but you know what? We, we, need, to re- be know how, we need to know how to apply that to our reality. You see, you were knit together in your mother's womb by God. You were fearfully and wonderfully made. You are known by the creator of the universe. You are known by the designer of all things. He says, you saw my unformed substance. And in your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. Before my days were even a reality to me, you wrote what those days would look like. I don't know about you, but I don't have the mind, the ability to wrap my arms around that truth. I'm so limited in my ability to grasp the concept of that, and yet this is what the scripture says. Paul will echo those words in his opening to the church in Ephesus. He says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him when, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us. I love that. That was the drive behind it, right? In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ. Why? According to the purpose of his own will. You see, sometimes we read those passages of Scripture and it evokes so much emotion, so much debate, so much divide. It's such a powerful text of scripture, yet so much effort and angst is spent at trying to reconcile God's sovereignty and man's responsibility in this passage of scripture that we miss the very essence of what it's saying. Can I just let you know, you will never be able to reconcile man's responsibility and God's sovereignty. And so instead of, cel- instead of focusing and dividing over the process, can we celebrate the results, right? The fact that, hey, before the foundation of the world, he chose me in love, he predestined me. I don't know what that looks like. I don't know why he did it. I wouldn't have chosen me, but he did. And as a result of that, I'm a child of God and so are you. Before I ever knew him, he knew me. He was there in my past. Before I was ever aware that God existed, he knew me and was with me. He is omnipresent. God is everywhere with all of himself all of the time. And he is omniscient. He knows everything there is to know about everything. And so you take omnipotent, you take his omnipresence and you, and you take his omniscience and we recognize that that is something that operates outside the arena of, et- of time in an eternal sense that we will never be able to understand on this side of eternity. And so we, as the clay, look to the potter and just love on him and bow to his sovereignty. I have been with you in the past And God has been with you in the past, whether you realize it or not. Only eternity will reveal the times that God has stepped into your life to protect you or to provide for you. Only eternity will reveal, and we didn't even know about it on this side of eternity. I've been with you in the past. We see it clearly in Scripture. We also see very clearly in Scripture that God says, I will be with you in the present. I will be with you now as well. We see this woven all throughout the scripture, God being with his people right then. The psalmist, going back to Psalm 139, I love the psalmist says, where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? It's a rhetorical question. There's no place I could possibly go. 
How do you hide from an all-present God? He says, if I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. I love that. He said, if I ascend to heaven, you are there. In other words, you are there in life. You are there in good times. You are there in all of life. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. He is there even in death. The psalmist will declare in chapter 23, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil for you are with me. And so we see the psalmist declaring that he's with us in life. He is with us in death. He said, if I take the wings of the morning, what is the wings of the morning? I sat out early this morning and watched the the sun come up and there was just such a peaceful moment this morning. If I take the wings of the morning, I'm reminded that God is there in times of peace. And then he says, and I dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea. What is that? Oftentimes throughout the scripture, the sea is ascribed to a time of chaos. It's a a time of turbulent storm and difficult times. And, And so ultimately what the psalmist is saying here is, I am even here in times of chaos. Your presence is even there in life, in death, in peace, and in chaos. Where can I go from your presence? The psalmist will declare in chapter 46, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in times of trouble. I like that. A present, present help is really what it says there. He is a present, present help in times of trouble. Therefore, because he is a present, present help in times of trouble, therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth gives way, and though the mountains, there it is again, be moved into the heart of the sea. Again, it's the picture of turbulence. It's a picture of a storm. It's a picture of chaos. I want you to kind of remind, just mark that in your minds. I'll revisit that a little bit later. But when we see the idea of the sea in scriptures, it has to do with this idea of chaos and storm in turbulent times. Though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling, the psalmist says, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation, the dwelling place of the most high God. Even in the midst of the storm, God is present. You see, our awareness of God's presence in our lives, in our past, need to inform our awareness of God's presence in our lives, in our present. We need to learn from our past and take that which we've learned from our past and apply it to our present, especially when we find ourselves going through the storm, especially when we find ourselves going through through difficult times of questioning. We need to look back and grab what we've learned from the past that before we even were aware of it, God was involved and present in my life. And if if he was present then, he would be present now. I've been with you in the past. I will be with you in the present Another truth we see woven throughout scripture is that God says, I will be with you tomorrow as well. Too much energy is spent and sleep is lost over the fears of of tomorrow, of the unknown. What will it be? One person said, today is the tomorrow that we worried about yesterday. And you know what? You made it. You're all right. Today is the tomorrow you worried about yesterday. And the same God who carried you yesterday will carry you today and he will carry you tomorrow. You know, fear is one of the most effective tools in the enemy's arsenal. Why? Because it is the antithesis of faith. God is causing and raising us up and teaching us to be a people of faith. And nothing will challenge our faith like embracing and and, and submitting to fear 
And so the enemy tries to diminish our faith by filling us with fear. And what we need to do is we need to starve our fear and feed our faith and walk in the faith of God's word. How do we build our faith? Faith comes by hearing and hearing of the word of God. You say, well, how how do I grow my faith? Get in the word. That's just, that is just a net. Listen, how do I get money in the bank? I put money in, right? It's very simple. You put money in, it grows. You spend time in the word of God, it's going to feed and increase your faith. That's what God's word says. It's not rocket science, folks. It's really not. You don't need to be a special son, special daughter. You just, you just invest time into the word of God and you will see how God uses that to build your faith. Don't fear what tomorrow holds. Listen, because God is already there. He is eternal. He does not wait for tomorrow to present itself because he is not in time. He is over time. Therefore, listen, he is already in your tomorrow. And because he's already in your tomorrow, you can rest assured that he will be with you. He is eternal. He is over time. Time is just something that is created for us here temporarily. God is not bound by it. God is not operating in it. God is over it. And so therefore, we need not fear. Isaiah declares in chapter 43 of his, of his writing, but now thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, For I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, that's future tense. In other words, listen, not if you pass. Doesn't say that. When you pass. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. Can I just tell you there's a time and a season in every one of our lives where you're going to, as Isaiah says, pass through the waters? But the good news is you're passing through the waters. You're not drowning in the waters, right? You're passing through the waters. But there's a time in every one of our lives where we will experience that. Where you will find yourself in the midst of the storm. Where you will wonder whether God is aware of what you're going through. Does he know what my situation is? Where we begin to even question his presence in our lives. It's the reality of every believer at one time or another. Listen, even John the Baptist, when he was in prison, awaiting to be executed, sent his disciples to Jesus to ask the question, are you really the one? Or should I wait for another? Hey, listen, if John the Baptist, the greatest man who ever lived, according to Jesus, could have moments of questioning in this humanity, how many know I can eat at his his table? Right? There are seasons that God brings us through. But listen, God will allow you to go through times in your life where you won't feel his presence like you once had. Can I just tell you, that's the design of sanctification. That's the plan. That's how God does things. He always will bring you through seasons where your emotions aren't enough to get you from where you are to where God wants you to be. I see it happen when people come to the church. They come in, they're like, oh, this is great. I'm excited, I'm growing, the worship is amazing. I'm I'm learning from the teaching. These people are wonderful. I'm just really feeling it, right? It's kind of like that that honeymoon experience. And those are wonderful and they're beautiful, but they don't last forever. And there are times where God will then allow us to not feel it so much, right? It's those times where we're not getting as much out of everyone and everything, not because it's not effective anymore, but what is God doing there? He is calling you and causing you to go deeper yourself. Listen, the day that I, and what comes over this pulpit is your only feeding source is the day that you are going to stall in your spiritual growth. 
This is never to be all that you get in the course of your week. The scripture calls us to give us this day our daily bread. We are to go to him regularly. And you see, God will allow those times into our life where we, we wonder, God, where are you? I'm not feeling it anymore. No one understands me. I don't even understand myself. And he'll bring us to a place where all we have is his ear. And it's in those times that the character of God is being developed into your life. It's in those times. He says, you'll seek me and you'll find me when you search for me with all of your heart. God loves when his people pursue him. And he will bring us to a place where all we have is the ability to pursue him. And what's on the other side of that is a spiritual growth and depth that only comes from growing, going through the storm. But even in those times, he is with us. He allows us to feel like his presence is lifted. Have you ever, want, have you ever thought, you don't have to raise your hand. I know, I, like I'm thinking, Lord, I know I preached this, but are you really with me? In those moments where we step and live by faith, know God, you know what? Your word says I'll, you'll never leave me and you'll never forsake me. I am not going to be controlled or governed by my feelings. I'm going to be controlled and governed by the God's word. And I'm holding tightly on to that. And you see, that's what builds the character and the maturity that goes the distance. That's what Job learned. This man of God who experienced all the worst that life could throw at someone, Right, his children are killed in a storm. His home and his livelihood are, are destroyed. His wealth was deteriorating. His wealth was, and his health are deteriorating. His, his friends aren't being helpful, nor is his wife at that point. And this man of God who at times earlier in his life enjoyed the presence and blessings of God like no other. How do I know that? Well, because Satan said that was the case when he approached himself, he stood before God. And God said, hey, you see my servant Job, there's nobody like him in all the land. Right, you remember that conversation? But here he is now in the storm. And it was in that time, we had nothing else to hold on to but God, that he said these words in Job 23 and verse 10, maybe, you can, maybe it resonates. He says, behold, I go forward, but he is not there and backward, and I do not perceive him. I look on the left when he is working, but I do not behold him. He turns to the right hand, but I do not see him. Have you ever felt like that? God, I know you're with me, but are you with me? I believe, help my unbelief. I look to the north, the south, the east, and the west. God, I don't see you. That's what Job came to. But he says this in verse 10, but he knows the way that I take. And when he has tried me, when he has matured me, when he is done with me, I shall come forth as gold. The only way you get from where you are to where God wants you to be is, listen, you're going to go through a storm. And it's in those times that God's presence, although maybe not felt, will always be with you. Our awareness of God's presence in our lives in our past needs to inform our awareness of God's presence in our lives in our present, and our, and our awareness of God's presence in our lives in our present needs to inform our awareness of God's presence in our lives, in our tomorrow. I have been with you in the past. I am with you in the present. I will be with you tomorrow. And then lastly, I will be with you forever. I will be with you forever. That's the end game, folks. God gathering his family together at the end or the consummation of all things when man is with his God for all 
of eternity. It's what Jesus pointed his worrying disciples to when just moments before, he's letting them know that soon he's going to leave them. And he sees the look of worry on their eyes. And he says these words, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go and prepare a place for you? In other words, would I, would I mess with you? Would I tease you? Would I lie, you, lie to you? He said, if I go and I prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you, speaking of the rapture, take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. That's the, that's the beauty, that's the design, that's the plan that God would take us so that where he is, we, we may be also. It's the reversal of the curse where now we will be forever in the presence of the Lord. I will be with you forever. The Apostle John on the island of Patmos gets a, a picture of this. He pens it for us in chapter 21 of Revelation. Look what he says. He says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. I mentioned earlier about the sea. Oftentimes people read that passage, they're like, wait a minute. There's not going to be any oceans in heaven? No no water? I mean, how many people love the sea? I love the water. Like, that's really, I know everything's going to be better in heaven, but really, you're going to take away the sea? No, that's why I pointed out to you earlier before what, what oftentimes the scripture is referring to when it makes reference to the sea. It's not this, you know, this liquid that we enjoy, you know, surfing and swimming in, but rather it's the chaos. It's the turmoil. It's the storm. That is no longer going to be there. He says, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea, the chaos, was no more. Thank God for that. And he says, and I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the front throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. It's the culmination of all things. Everything has been reversed and put back in order where creation is now walking with creator, and we are with God forever and ever and ever. And it says, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And death shall be no more, neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. Why? For the former things have passed away. That's what awaits, church. That's what awaits. It is as sure as the integrity of God himself. This is the promise that the psalmist penned so many years ago and he closes out that famous Psalm 23 where he says, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Hey, this life is short. And I don't know about you, but the older you get, the quicker it seems to go. They kind of said it's kind of like a roll of toilet paper. The closer you get to the end, the quicker it goes. And if all we had in this life was what 70, 80, what years we might have, how sad that is. But thankfully, that is not even a blip on the screen of what God has created for us. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we'll have no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. And the most amazing thing about that moment is it'll be done in the presence of God. Don't get discouraged. Don't get distracted, child of God, by the, the things and the cares of this world that are so temporary. It's a simple truth, yet not so simple. After all, it needs to inform 
everything we do and see and believe. He is with us. I have been with you in the past. I will be with you. I am with you in the present. I will be with you tomorrow. And I will be with you forever. The psalmist said, where can I go from your presence? The answer is nowhere. The God who is always there for you. Let's pray. Father, I recognize that as we unpack these truths, so many people are in different places in life right now. This message will mean different things to different people depending on the circumstances they find themselves in. Struggling with cancer and relationships and jobs and work and worry and all of those things. I pray, Lord, that you would take that which is from your word and you would allow that to eclipse the fears of tomorrow that it would inform our mindsets. I pray, Lord, that you would come alongside those that find themselves in a weary day. Your word reminds us that you draw close to those of a broken heart. And I pray that, Lord, you would, as in a way that only you can, would you meet each person right where they're at today, that this word would bring forth fruit and encouragement and hope and life and they would drive us to a passionate pursuit of you the lover of our souls in Christ's name we pray amen